I'm John Abu Cannon, and in this video, we're going to have a bit of a dive into probably the most common approach to synthesis that has ever existed, the idea of subtractive synthesis. Now, you may be real students of um, synthesizer history, and you'll know if you are one of those that there have been loads of different approaches to the ways that synthesizers go about the process of making sounds through the years. But subtractive synthesis and the model that sits at the heart of how sounds can be made using that synthesis met method continue to be really popular. And loads of logic synthesizers use that as a means to go about offering you a sort of parameter set for you to build the sounds of your choice. And as a result of that, I think it's a really good idea that we spend some time really understanding how subtractive synthesis works. And the way that I tend to explain subtractive synthesis whenever I am trying to explain it to someone for the first time is I ask someone to imagine the Olympic rings. And I'm going to ask you to imagine the same thing. Let's just draw this and so we can see a sort of wireframe diagram of how a subtractive synthesizer works. So when I say uh, let's think about the Olympic rings, what I'm talking about, of course, is our five concentric circles where we have three across the top. And then two underneath. Now, broadly speaking, within a subtractive synthesizer, what we've got are three modules which are essential. We have to have these in order for a synthesizer to make a sound. And then we have two optional ones. These are the interrupters, the things that come along to help shape sounds in slightly more advanced, interesting ways. So let's concentrate on the top, first of all. The first of our circles is what's called the oscillator. Now, an oscillator in a subtractive synthesizer is a waveform. You'll have seen those shapes that we see in RetroSynth in the ES1 and the ES2. And all of those shapes are different combinations of what we call harmonics. They're different relationships between what we call the fundamental, the note that we actually play when we play a synthesizer sound, and a range of harmonics which are attached to that fundamental. Some sounds are very rich in harmonics and have a big open sound, and others are far more muted, purer, if you like. And the oscillator stage is where we have a chance to combine different oscillators to produce the starting point for our sound. Another way of thinking about it would be this is the raw material from which our sounds are going to be made, and the oscillator does that. So we have things like sawtooth waves and square waves. And we also have the, the purest sound of all, the sine wave. So all of these different waveforms form the oscillator stage and they're the beginning of a synthesized sound. The second module is called the filter. Now what the filter does is it takes the harmonic content which has been generated at the oscillator stage and it then allows us to start thinking about how we want to remove harmonics from our sound. Now you might be thinking, well, hang on, if you don't want those, those harmonics in the first place, why build them at the oscillator stage? Well, filters are more interesting than that. What they allow us to do is to say, well, I might want a control that goes from a sound which is very bright to being very dull to being very bright again. Or we might want a sound which sweeps from being very dull and then opens up to become very bright. If we don't have the potential of that at the oscillator stage, we can't allow the filter stage to open up or close around the harmonic groups to give us a change in tone in a way that filters provide. So the filter stage allows us to variably control the harmonic content which has been generated at the oscillator stage. And again, filters come in many different forms. We have what are called low pass filters and they let through low harmonics and filter out high harmonics. And we have the opposite, the high pass filter, which lets through high harmonics, but gets rid of low um, harmonics. And there are band pass filters as well, which let through a group of filter, uh, frequencies in the middle, but filter out um, frequencies on either side. So filters, variable state filters, allow us to decide which harmonics we're going to hear. And lastly, we have what's called the amplifier section. Now, the amplifier gives all of this volume. What we need is to turn our electrical signal into something that we can actually hear, and the amplifier does that. Now, here's another way of thinking about this. If this all seems a little bit technical, I would ask you one question, which is, imagine any musical instrument and ask yourself that at any given moment in time when it's making a sound, what are the parameters, what are the things that you can control within that sound? So for instance, if I'm playing a violin and I drag the bow across the string, what am I hearing there? Well, firstly, I'm hearing pitch. 
Then I'm hearing tone. So in other words, how that sound appears. Is it very hard and aggressive and biting? Or is it something that's kind of more melodious and smooth? And lastly, how loud is it? So in other words, what we have is control over pitch, which is fundamentally controlled at the oscillator stage, over tone, which is controlled at the filter stage. And lastly, we have volume, which is controlled at the amplifier stage. So our three separate modules up here at the top control pitch, tone, and volume, and they're called the oscillator, filter, and amplifier sections. Okay, so what about those interrupters that I mentioned? Well, so far, if you can imagine a sound made of an oscillator, a filter, and an amplifier, you can probably imagine a, a sound that's kind of made up of a block of different harmonics. We talked about the fact that the filter allows us to change how we hear those harmonics over time, but at the moment we don't really have a control that's changing that in some way. And our amplifier is producing volume for us, but again, it's probably just a fixed block of sound. It's not changing in terms of getting louder or quieter. What we need is some controllers that are going to allow us to shape different things here. And the two most common ones of those that exist within a subtractive synthesizer are called low frequency oscillators, or LFOs for short, and envelopes. So these are our two optional modules. Now let's be clear, when I say optional, what I mean is you can make a sound with an oscillator, a filter, and an amplifier without using these at all. But if you want your sound to ebb and flow, to change in some way, then these become extremely useful. So firstly, let's talk about LFOs. The O in an LFO stands for oscillator, and we've already learned about oscillators. We know that they're shapes which are combinations of different harmonics. So what's the difference with a low frequency oscillator compared to a regular oscillator? Well, let's imagine our friend the sine wave again. Here is our nice waveform. And let's imagine for a second that this low undulating waveform, which is rising and falling, let's imagine that its output, the shape that it's producing, could be patched into one of these three elements above. For instance, if I was to take the output of an LFO and I was to take it into the oscillator stage, what would happen is that the pitch of that sound would rise and fall and rise and fall. And we'd get an effect that in musical terms we call vibrato. The idea of a note that goes from being a flat pitch bass to one that just starts to modulate up and down. Now, if we do that a lot, if we apply a lot of LFO, we get a sound like a police car siren, something that's really wide and really broad. And if we keep it very narrow, we get something more like a violinist would play when they play a note and begin to bend that note backwards and forwards. So a little bit of vibrato there. Let's look at what happens when we take an LFO into the filter section. What would happen there is our sound would be dull, and then it would be bright, and then it would be dull, and then it would be bright, and it would ramp up and down and go backwards and forwards. And again, there's a term we use for that as well, and guitarists know this well, that's called wah. This whole idea of a sound that gets bright and dull and bright and dull as quickly as it can, or as slowly as it can, depending on how fast we set that LFO um, being. And then lastly, what we have is the idea of an LFO plugged into the amplifier section. What happens if we do that? Well, our sound would be quiet, and then it would be loud, and then it would be quiet, and then it would be loud, and we call that tremolo. That's again a really popular guitar technique where we strum a chord and we hear it's volume switching on and off, and rather than just a big block of sound, what instead we get is this movement, this shape, and this change. Okay, so that explains LFOs. What we've got is a shape, a waveform, which can be used to interrupt any one of these three uh, component pieces above. What about envelopes? Well, envelopes usually have four separate stages, and we call those attack, decay, sustain, and release. And you'll see them frequently drawn like this. What this basically shows us is that we've got the change, a change to sound over time. Now, the easiest way to imagine an envelope is to imagine it plugged into the amplifier section of a sound. When I play a note on my keyboard, how quickly does it speak or make a noise? Well, that's controlled by the attack time. If I play a note and it takes some time to fade in, it has a long attack time. And if I play a note and it speaks immediately, it has a very short attack time. What we then have is a second stage, which is called decay, where the sound has an opportunity just to drop away in volume a little bit before entering its sustain portion. Sustain is where its volume is going to stay as an absolutely flat line before we let go of the note. And when we let go of it, we enter the release phase. And this is the point after which, when we let go of the note, it takes time for the sound to die away. And again, if it's long, that means it will fade out very smoothly. And if the release time is very short, then the sound will almost immediately stop.
So we can imagine a whole bunch of sounds and the ways in which they might decay. If we were to take, for instance, a snare drum, for instance, very quick attack, we get a decay that goes all the way to silence. There is no sustained portion at all. There's no part of a snare drum where the sound is staying at an obvious volume or um, a, a fixed volume, and therefore there's no release time either. So very quick attack and some decay. If we imagine the shape of an electric organ sound, again, we'd get a very fast attack, but then we get a really long sustained portion. For as long as I hold that note down, it's just gonna stay at maximum volume. And when I let go of it, it releases quite quickly. So you can imagine different shapes applied to the amplifier stage to control volume. But just like the LFOs, envelopes can be plugged into the filter section. And what they're then gonna do is to control the tone of a sound over time. A little while ago, I mentioned the idea of a synth sweeping. Okay, so a sweep might involve a long attack phase where the sound goes from being very dull and moody and slowly gets brighter and fuller and richer. And again, we could control that with a long attack time for an envelope that was plugged into the filter. And if we wanted to, what we could also do would be to plug an envelope all the way over here into the oscillator stage. If you want a sound which has got a little bit of pew on it so that we get a pitch on the front and a note that drops from being a high note to a low note, again, we could take an envelope and we could apply that into the oscillator stage. So what these two controllers allow us to do is to make these three elements a little bit more refined and a little bit more complicated. Okay, should we see how that all works within Logic's synthesizers? So let's look at the first of Logic synthesizers that uses subtractive synthesis as its kind of model. I'm going to open up RetroSynth. And if that whole idea of the Olympic rings approach makes sense to you, you'll be delighted to see that that's exactly how RetroSynth is lined up. What we've got here is an oscillator phase in the top left, a stage in the top left-hand corner. We've got the filter in the middle at the top, and then we've got the amplifier section over here. We can ignore these for a moment. These are effects that are effectively being added to the amplifier stage. For now, we're going to leave those alone. Our amplifier section here contains a volume control and we'll come to this sine level control in a little while. So what we've got across the top are our three separate stages. And then we can see our interrupters underneath. Here's our LFO stage. And here are two separate envelopes, one for the filter to control tone and one to control the amplifier. Okay, so let's just play a sound and begin to experiment with what happens when we begin to build a sound using two separate oscillators. You can see that within uh, RetroSynth, we've got oscillator one here, and we can see its shape. Some of those shapes that I drew on the paper a little while ago are present again here. We've got a square wave, and uh, we can vary what's called the pulse width, so how square that sound is. And we've got a couple of other options here as well. And then we've got a second shape, which is down here at the bottom. So when we're designing a sound, what we can do first of all is to move the mix dial between oscillator one and oscillator two all the way up to oscillator one so that we're only hearing that when we play a note. So what we're hearing at the moment is this shape that's here, and we're in a position to change that if we want to, and we'll hear that all by itself. Okay, so we've got um, two very obviously musical but different harmonic sets here from these two different waveforms. And then we have what's called a noise generator. And a noise generator is every single frequency playing back at the same volume. And the reason why you can't detect the pitch of noise is because there is no fixed fundamental frequency where your brain attaches to that note and says, oh, it's a C or an A or a G sharp. Instead, what we've got is every single frequency playing together and it sounds a bit like radio static. So that's um, a different type of waveform, but again, what we've got there is harmonic content, um, and the variableness of that is determined by which shape we choose. Okay, so what we can then do is to choose one of these shapes and then blend it with oscillator two. So if I choose a different shape here, what I can then do is to blend these two shapes together. So what I've got now is a mix between two separate waveforms. And if I want to, I can detune one against the other. Which produces a slightly more powerful sound. But nevertheless, it's still the same that we've got our two separate waveforms which are being blended. Okay, let's look at the filter section next. What we've got here is the all important what's called cutoff dial. And what this does is to set the point at which we start filtering out or reducing the frequency content below the cutoff point. RetroSynth 
um, has a multi-stage uh, filter. In other words, we can choose different types of shape for it. And the one that we're using at the moment is a low pass filter. It lets through low frequency content, but and uh, therefore gets rid of high frequency content. So as we move the cutoff frequency down, we'll hear the tone changing on the sound. And we can hear that really clearly. We can hear that we uh, always hear the lowest frequencies. And as we move the cutoff frequency up, what we're doing is we're letting through more of the high frequency content. Okay, so, for, so far, so straightforward. What filters tend to do as well is to give you this second control, which is referred to as resonance. And what that does is it turns up the volume of frequencies at the cutoff point. So in other words, at exactly the point where we're just beginning to get rid of frequency content above a particular point, we can add volume to it. And this little resonance control here allows us to do that. So if I perform the same sweep, but with resonance turned up, we'll hear a sort of more acidic, slightly more biting version of that same sweep. So that's no resonance. and that's with resonance, so I have a chance to sort of boost that. Now, if I want to, I can experiment with different filter types up here as well. When I click here, I can see there are many different versions of low-pass filters, which are either more extreme and cut out more high-frequency content, or less extreme, less harsh, letting through a little bit more of those upper frequencies while just beginning to roll them off. And we also have band pass and high pass filters options here as well, which do the opposite. They either let through high frequency content cutting out the lows, or they let through a band of frequencies right in the middle, getting rid of low frequency content below that and high frequency content above. And then we have the amplifier section. This is the easiest one. This is where we've got an overall volume control. And then separately, we've got this extra little sine level control, which builds in a, a sine wave underneath the sounds that we've got already. Now, sine waves are those undulating waveforms that I drew on the paper before. They provide us with this very pure, rich sound. And adding a little bit of a sine wave under your sound will just give it a bit of extra reinforcement. So by turning that up, we're just getting a little bit of extra weight at the bottom as we just pull in this sine wave underneath the other um, oscillators that we've added. Okay, so there's the top section. There's our oscillator, filter, and amplifier section. What we've then got is an LFO, and we've also got our two envelopes. Now, we're already hearing the envelopes. Let's deal with those first and come back to the LFO in a moment. At the moment, you can hear, if I take the amplifier envelope, for instance, this is, of course, already being applied to this sound. It's already plugged into this sound. And the reason that I know that is because when I play a sound, it's speaking very quickly. Its attack phase is very short, so the sound immediately um, plays. And the moment I let go of a note, it immediately stops because the release time down here is also really short. So let's experiment with some slightly different shapes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce the sustain level. I'm going to increase the attack time. And I'm also going to increase the release time. Now, what this should mean is that the sound fades in and then drops away through its decay phase, rests at a sustain level which is lower than it was before, and then when I let go of a note altogether, we should hear its release time. So we should hear all four stages much more clearly now. I'm just going to play one chord. Okay, now the reason why it took so long for the sound to decay is because that's currently set at the maximum of 10 seconds. So if I pull that back, obviously we'll hear those four stages um, evolve more quickly, but still slowly compared to where we were before. So let's go back to the sort of shape that we had before so we can hear this more clearly. And let's just now experiment with a sound that's much more percussive. So in other words, I'm going to have an immediate attack and a really short little decay. Here's exactly the same sound, but with that shape instead. You can hear the release phase, which is happening right now. And again, if I was to pull down the release time so it's as short as the decay, or even a little bit shorter, we end up with a much spikier sound. 
So now we can see how the um, amp envelope works. Now let's go back to something which is a little bit more sustained so we can hear it a bit more clearly and something that's going to last a little longer and stick around so that we've got a sound so we have a chance to experience um, the filter envelope at work as well. So the filter envelope is here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make some settings a bit like the more percussive sort of shape we had a moment ago. But remember, this time, rather than affecting the volume of the sound, it's going to affect the tone of the sound. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull the cutoff frequency down overall and here I have a chance to decide with this envelope control how much of this shape is going to affect the filter. In other words, the more I turn this up, the more of this shape is going to be applied to the tone of the sound. So what we should hear is a sound that I'm going to just slightly increase the attack time that gets a little bit brighter over half a second and then maybe drops away after that to become a little bit more muted through its uh, decay and sustain phases. And you can hear that really rapid little sort of swell in the way that that tone behaves. So if we were to make the attack time longer, we'd end up with a much more sort of obviously swelling pad. And what I'm going to do is to just slightly increase the cutoff frequency so it swells to a slightly higher brightness than it was before. before then dropping away. And that kind of shape's really nice for low end stuff. Nice. Raspy synth basses. And again, we hear all that sort of release time there in the amplifier. Okay, let's turn the envelope routing down a little bit in the filter section and come back to the LFO. So what I have a chance to do here is to decide how I want this to work within the context of uh, this, um, this sound that I'm building. So the LFO module is here and the first thing I can do is to choose a shape for it. I'm going to choose this undulating shape like we have at the moment. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this on within the filter section so we can begin to see what happens when we take an LFO and begin to introduce it into one aspect of the synth. So what I've got here is a chance just to decide how much of the tone I want to have rise and fall. And what I can do here is to choose the speed of that just here. So let's start with something slow so we can begin to hear this being introduced and then we'll make it more rapid and we we'll, should hear the tone opening up and closing uh, very obviously as we play through this sound. Okay, let's close the filter down a little bit more and make that a little bit more extreme. Try that again. Okay, and now let's switch shape. So rather than something which is rising and falling in the way that it has been, let's try a square wave instead. And you can hear that sound switching on and off in the way that it is. So what we've got here is that an LFO now controlling tone. It's getting brighter and duller and brighter and duller, and we can vary the speed over which that happens. And actually within this synthesizer, I can even synchronize this by turning this on so that effectively the movement happens clocked to the tempo of my piece. So if I want that to switch on and off, let's say in quarter notes or in eighth notes, I can. So within this video, what we've started to do is to look at subtractive synthesis. We've learned that there are three essential modules that make up a subtractive synthesizer. The oscillator, which is where we combine different harmonics to form the building blocks of our sound. 
the filter, which then takes those harmonics and allows us to decide which ones of those we're going to hear at any given moment in time. We've learned that there are two really important controls there. The cutoff frequency, which sets the point above or below which we start filtering out different harmonics, and resonance, which gives us a little bit of boost at that cutoff point. And then we've seen that we need an amplifier to give the whole of that volume. And then we've seen our two different versions of our interrupters. The LFO, which introduces a waveform which can be patched into different parts of the synthesizer above it um, in order to change, in this case, its tone so that we can hear its tone undulating up and down. And then our envelopes, this attack, decay, sustain and release approach, which allows us to set the four separate stages of how the filter and the amplifier in this context are going to behave over time.